I think I saw somebody walk in, so I'll introduce myself again. My name is Dylan. I'm going to be speaking now on uh, my master's project, so uh, this is a little bit more in-depth. I'm quite a bit more familiar with this one. Um, but uh, essentially, my, my idea here was to deploy these accelerometers on captive smoothhound sharks with the goal of sort of identifying what specific, specific swimming patterns looked like from that accelerometer data and then seeing if we could, without even seeing the sharks, start to sort of classify what's going on, categorize what's going on, how they're swimming. Um, I was supervised by Peter Ryan at UCT um, as part of my AMS degree. Um, so I spoke a little bit before about sort of this progression of scientific research. We start with just describing things and then we test hypotheses. I blabbed on and on about that. Um, but the marine environment presents a particularly unique um, logistical issue um, with making these sort of basic direct observations. Um, there's a, a vast scale of ocean out there. And in some of the best conditions, visibility of 30 meters is a fraction of the home range of some of these animals. Um, scuba was a great uh, invention, uh, but we're still very limited in how far we can go underwater, what we can see underwater, how quickly we can swim. Um, Brubs is a, a great tool, I think, for penetrating that limitation. Um, but really, it's hard to make these sort of fun, the fundamental observations that we need in order to start building up our knowledge base, moving on to um, explore, uh, you know, exploring different hypothesis testing. Um, so one of the things that we've done is started tagging animals, telemetry. Um, this sort of shifts the perspective of this outside observer to right on the back of the very animal itself. Uh, we've got fewer limitations in this way. So generally what we get is kind of this spatiotemporal data. Um, classically, you know, we use acoustic tags or satellite tags. Um, more and more the technology is advancing. But from this information, uh, we can do, make some inferences of behavior. In this area, this is a satellite track, uh, sorry, an acoustic track of a shark. I think it was actually one I just used in that previous presentation. But this is Muscle Bay, we've got um, some activity here by Hurtbrock River. We know it's a reef structure, maybe there's some foraging going on. Here we've got some directed travel using <coughs> a depth contour here as well. Um, and then in this case also, I don't know if it's navigation or here we're resting in the shallow water. But you know, we can start to make guesses at what's going on. But really, it's just position in space and time. There's not a whole lot of information there. Um, so we start adding sensors to these tags. Nowadays, we've got about 24, I think, different sensors that are commonly in use. Things like ECGs, <coughs> measuring heart rate of a free swimming animal. CTDs, measuring the external environment the animal is swimming through, the conductivity, the temperature, um, the water depth. The accelerometer is one of these new devices that I've been playing with. Um, just to put it quickly, if any of you guys have smartphones or tablets, you shake your screen around, the screen moves, you jiggle it, it changes the songs. That's all an accelerometer at work. It detects those changes in direction, and then it tells the screen to move or the, the computer to shuffle the songs. Um, so we're, we're basically measuring movement, um, but we can also measure gravity. That's also an acceleration. And from these two things, we can start looking at, you know, what's the orientation of the animal in the water column? How frequently is the tail beat swimming, uh, moving? And from here, we can kind of start to group different behaviors without even really seeing it. Um, this is essentially what you get from an accelerometer. This is a triaxial accelerometer. So we've got acceleration in the heave axis, that would be up and down, the sway axis, left and right, and then the surge axis, forward and back. Um, you can see here though that you know it's not very clear what's going on. It doesn't say, oh, right here it was swimming um, steadily, here it was burst swimming. There's a bit of kind of Manipulating, manipulating the data that needs to be done, and then some interpretation. Uh, so that's sort of what I wanted to do um, with this project. We wanted to sort of um, just ground truth it, kind of get an idea of what different swimming patterns looked like from the accelerometer data. And then from there, you know, perhaps free swimming deployments, identifying maybe specific areas where specific behaviors were occurring. Um, so in order to sort of test this, uh, I, I looked at three different methods for observing behavior. Visually, we had a couple observers at a, at a tank down at the aquarium here, if any of you guys have visited yet, and they were just recording sort of a time series of a focal individual, 
and noting down the occurrence of different behaviors, their durations and their lengths. And then um, at the same time, these guys were affixed with accelerometers. So I looked at that data manually and sort of interpreted it second by second, just from my knowledge of physics. Um, and then the last thing we did was kind of an unsupervised computational analysis where we put it through um, some algorithms that kind of clustered it, sort of similar to what I did before, um, and then sort of spit out this automated response of what, what the computer thought statistically, you know, the different clusters were. Um, so I'm going to walk through, walk through some of those tools quickly in a moment. Um, the first study site we used was this pelagic tank, we call it, down at the aquarium. Seven by two by two meters, um, I don't know, about maybe this size, and we generally keep smooth hounds in it and some other fish. I was working with the common smooth hound. Uh, we had a few people talking about this guy today. But um, I think the important thing here really is that he is listed as a vulnerable species, and in Southern Africa in particular, I think Charlene um, looked at some of the recruitment models and found that our current catch rates would need to be halved in order for this to be considered sustainably fished or exploited. So there is um, sort of a relevance to using this as a uh, model species if we were to then do these free swimming deployments. All right, so getting into the methods now, um, I selected four behaviors that I thought might be most easily identified by an observer watching these animals in the tank. Um, these were also based on similar studies that had been published. And these were steady swimming, gliding, resting, and burst swimming. So steady swimming I kind of defined as this regular rhythmic undulations of the tail around the tank, you know, even frequency, even uh, periodicity or amplitude of the tail beat. You know, just it's kind of everyday swimming. Gliding I defined as moving but with the absence of tail strokes. So when the animal was, was gliding, <laughs> essentially. Um, and then resting behavior, similar to gliding, no tail beats, but the animal's no longer moving. It's parked on the seabed of the tank, or the tank bed, I guess. Um, and then the last one, this burst, or this fast start swimming. So occasionally we'd see if somebody, a little kid came and tapped on the glass, or if another fish spooked the smooth hounds, you'd see this kind of quick tail beat, quick start action, and it would swim off. Um, another thing we were looking at <coughs> also was the posture of the, the animal, the pitch or the body angle. Um, and these things were recorded just as a um, visual observation by um, observers watching the animal directly. It wasn't from video camera, which is an important note. Um, and then from there, we got our visual record. So the next thing I needed to do was get an accelerometer record. So we've got here an example of sort of how I had to manipulate this information to get the, the, that tail beat frequency out of it. Um, I mentioned Changes in direction are an acceleration, and changes in gravity are also acceleration. So these two components are kind of measured in the same signal, and we need to separate them. Um, there's a few ways of doing this. Some of the more common ones are um, low-pass filters, where you, you set a threshold value, and then anything higher than this will be allowed through, and anything lower is, um, you know, you're, you're using these filters to separate the signals. I did something. Uh, it's similar in theory, but it's approached differently. I basically used a smoothing window and move this window along and then sort of use that to filter out my lower frequencies from my higher frequencies. So anyway, the idea here, uh, we've got this red trace um, in the background here. That is the raw acceleration in the sway axis that we're looking at here. And you can see there's some high frequency oscillations and then also these lower frequency in the blue. And the idea is if you filter out if you use a filter that is at least one um, full cycle of the tail stroke, you can smooth those out entirely. So you're no longer looking at the individual oscillations of the tail, you're looking at um, what we assume is um, the changes due to gravity, the lower frequency oscillations. So that's this blue line here. And then from there, subtract blue from the red, you get that dynamic movement, the tail beats. And this makes sense. We've got a tail stroke to the left would be a positive one, a tail stroke to the right might be a negative one, so we do see you know, it's right along zero here. So each of these peaks and troughs would be a tail beat, and then we have frequency and amplitude. So that allowed me to then go through and kind of manually interpret it. I'll show you guys a demonstration on that in a bit. Um, the other thing I did 
was, I didn't do this visually, uh, well we, we observed the posture of the shark directly visually, but from the accelerometer record I just uh, basically used the calculation. We have the surge axes of the accelerometer, that's this one, going forward and back. So in this orientation, gravity is perpendicular, that surge axis doesn't feel any gravity. As soon as you start to tilt up, then you get a little bit in that axis. So from the arc sign of this surge axis, you can figure out the pitch of the shark, the body angle. Um, so we observe that visually at the tank, and then we also, I also, uh, from the accelerometer, just calculated the arc sign and then compared those two to see if it <coughs> matched up. Um, I'll give you guys a demonstration here. Before it starts, there's going to be a shark swimming on the bottom, and then an accelerometer trace on the top, and a little... No, didn't play? Uh, ah, sorry, sorry. You just click it's it. Uh -huh. You just click in this area, okay. it should play. And then there's a trace up above with a red dot, and that's sort of the point in time that we were looking at. Okay, so this is our guy down here. He's got the accelerometer, and you can see no movement. He's resting on the seafloor there. And then in a couple minutes, we'll start seeing those tail beats. I watched a lot of sharks doing nothing, just swimming around in circles, so you guys can feel my pain. Alright, so it's hard to watch both at the same time, but you get these sort of one tail stroke in one direction will be a peak, and the other direction will be a trough. And then some of these bigger ones here are turns, and we'll see soon that the shark should approach that corner and do kind of a big sweeping turn. Um, so we can, you know, if we're just looking at this record, we can actually follow the shark, find out what he's doing. Here's another example. There should be another turn coming up here with this big sweeping one. Alright. More or less. And then we kind of get this activity again where there's a steady swimming. And so without, I mean, I could block this out and probably tell you pretty confidently what the shark is doing um, based on just watching that trace there. I think in a bit though we have a burst event, which is a little bit more exciting. So hopefully... <laughs> Coming up yeah, there it is. <coughs> the looming burst event. <laughs> Building up anticipa anticipation. <coughs> Maybe I should have shortened this one. Um, but yeah, we'll see this. And there you go, something happened. I don't know what it was, I can see, but it's got that burst event. So there's a potential here. Um, we're looking at very fundamental um, behavioral patterns, steady swimming, very coarse definition. Um, you know, but you add a little bit more information, I'll talk about that in a moment, uh, but you can start to pluck out very specific behaviors, breach events perhaps, um, flight response, that sort of thing. Uh, so that's, that was the, the first sort of comparison. I assumed that my visual observations were sort of the, the truth and then I compared two methods of interpretation of the accelerometer record against those. The first one was that manual interpretation where I basically went second by second of that graph that was scrolling by and manually classified um, from there. Um, the other one that I used was sort of this unsupervised uh, clustering analysis. So we'll start in this corner over here. This is the dynamic sway axis that I showed we interpreted our tail beats from. Um, and what the, this, the software is called Ethographer and it's coded specifically for interpreting accelerometer signatures. Mostly been used in birds though. Um, but what we start with is we run something, if you guys are familiar with the Fourier transformation, it sort of plucks out the frequency of um, the signal that you send through. It does something similar to that, but rather than getting just an overall frequency, we preserve this time sequence here. So it's called a continuous wavelet transformation. Uh, in this axis, we're looking at the, the cycle duration, um, so how long for a complete, you know, complete uh, wavelength, I think. Um, and you see here, there's one second duration, sort of a band here, and then this lower frequency, these bouts here, and um, we've got higher frequency ones up here. And then in this three-dimensional axis, the color axis, you've got amplitude. Um, in this high frequency, there's also a high amplitude signal, and you can see that reflected here, this very large amplitude. Um, so this basically just decomposes the signal into um, something that we can then sort of start to manipulate computationally, I guess. The next step was this clustering approach, and we used the k-means clustering, or the software incorporates a k-means clustering algorithm. Uh, you predefine how many clusters you would like it to segment these 
um, cycles and amplitudes into. I chose 20. That sort of empirically proved to be the um, the best at getting this wide range of amplitudes. So if I did four, I was only looking at four behaviors, so it naturally I would expect four clusters. Um, it would sometimes miss these higher amplitude, higher frequency burst events. So I oversampled it, and then I would combine some of these guys here. Um, so what we're looking at, this is frequency, amplitude. This red trace is what I would interpret as the burst event, high frequency of tailbeats, high amplitude, very strong tailbeats. This orange one here is lower frequency, um, but you can see it's a bit distinct from this group here. That I would interpret as the gliding, the lower frequency. Generally, the shark wouldn't move, <laughs> uh, move its tailby too much, but there would be you know, slight oscillations when it was gliding. Um, this purple trace here, that's the resting. There's very little amplitude, almost you know, no identifiable frequency there. And then we have this group here, which is sort of varying degrees of steady swimming, varying intensities of that steady swimming. And we see that the frequency is right around that one tail beat um, per second range, or one cycle length per tail beat range, depending on how you look at it. Um, so anyways, I would combine these and consider them one. I, I uh, intentionally oversampled over -sampled it. Um, OK, so what, what I get is this sort of clustering time series. Um, we're looking in this row, this is cluster zero, the burst event, so it detected high frequency, high amplitude event here. Um, that's the only one. I said the orange ones perhaps were gliding behaviors. There's one here, one here. You get the idea. Here's resting. And then this middle just squashed it down and said those are all steady swimming. So this is, it's, this is basically the, the bulk of the, the, the analysis here. We've got the visual observations, basically put, um, graphed in a similar method what I showed before, a manually observed burst, manually observed burst, resting, steady swimming, gliding. And then we have the record from my manual interpretation of the accelerometer signal. And you can see, you know, there's a burst that was detected here also, this one, a false detection, um, again here. So there's, there's some that match up, some that don't. Same with the gliding, I thought maybe a few of these might be gliding events, but we didn't observe them visually. You get the idea. Same thing with the uh, unsupervised analysis up above. So how, how do these match? I, I mean, if you stand back, it looks pretty good to me. You can't, you can't just say that um, <laughs> uh, based on, on looks. We've got to quantify it. So what I did was sort of looked at true detection rates and false detection rates. And I calculated true detection rates as the number of events, assuming that what we observe visually is the truth, the number of true events that were detected by the accelerometer, or in my you know, comparison, by the pathographer analysis. And then I also <coughs> calculated false detection rates. And these are the number of behaviors in the experimental method that were not calculated in the, um, the truth, so to speak. Um, so I'll show you these numbers. but. You know, it, it might be a, oh, let's just go ahead and do that. Um, the first thing I did it for, I don't have a, a graph of the postural one. I did a postural analysis, looked at posture from accelerometer, posture from video. We didn't do a, really an unsupervised one. Argus, we got this. Um, but you'll see here, it didn't really work. <laughs> the accelerometer um, truly detected incline and decline swimming very poorly, 25%, 50%, and had these very high false detection rates. Um, but I just wanted to clarify, they're not meant to add up to 100. They're looking at different things here. So um, a true detection is looking at the proportion of true events that were detected. The false detection is looking at the proportion of experimental events that were not detected, uh, that did not exist. So they, they shouldn't add up to 100 if that's confusing anybody. Um, but you see here, even with these very coarse um, categories of posture, it really, there's not a lot of information here. There was some success in the neutral category, um, very low false detections <coughs> and very high true detections, but that could be, you know, 90% of the time the animal is swimming horizontally. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about why, maybe why this failed in a bit. But then again, this uh, didn't really work as well as I had hoped for the behavior also. I'm just watching it uh, on a computer, it does match up quite well, but we struggled to really say this quantitatively. Um, you'll see here, for both the manual interpretation, we had pretty similar results across manual and ethographer. 
on the unsupervised one. 90% steady swimming, 90 or so, very low false detection rates. But those burst events and the gliding events, burst events you would expect are very distinct. You'd, you'd expect to be able to pluck those out very easily. Um, but again, very high false detections, very low true detections. Gliding, very low. Resting, a little bit better, 60%. Um, the unsupervised one went down to 30%. Um, so it, it really, it's not as, as clear as I would have hoped. But there is a little bit of information to be gathered from this. And I think it's the ability of the device to differentiate between, maybe even make this simpler, periods of inactivity or activity. Um, just looking at steady and rest as the two, we could clump these into those groups also. But you know, we do have some strength in looking at not moving versus moving, which could be quite useful in um, uh, free swimming deployments. So what went so horribly wrong, or maybe not too horribly, but why didn't this work? Uh, I think a few people have sort of touched on some of these elements in their presentation. Um, but the first one is that smoothing window that I spoke about, where we separate the gravitational acceleration from the dynamic movement of the tail, that acceleration. Um, I just arbitrarily, not necessarily arbitrarily, but um, I used some previous methods where they had said for an animal, animal that has a cycle length of about three seconds or less than three seconds, you can use three seconds as an appropriate window. Ideally, you would want to tune that to your animal very specifically. So for instance, a whale shark takes a very long time to sweep their tail. You would need a smoothing window that's very long to filter those out. Um, smaller animals, very quick. Um, so I used a pretty safe one at three seconds or so. And you can see we were able to look at individual tail beats pretty uh, successfully, I think. Um, so that, that could have introduced a bit of error. Maybe we were interpreting some gravity as um, dynamic, some dynamic as gravity. I think if I go back and more finely tune that filter, it might have a little bit more success. But I don't think that's really the, the issue here. Um, for the postural discrimination, um, you, kind of, you fix this logger and you assume that the way you've attached it is perfectly horizontal, but there is a bit of a, an attachment angle there. So maybe I need to do some kind of calibration for that. I think that might improve those results. Um, but I think really what's the issue here is this multiple observer bias. I, Lauren mentioned that with her using brubs, it's the same person interpreting that data. There is no intervariability or whatever of changing observers. And the way we sort of made our observations was with volunteers coming through a month. I trained them up as best I could, but you know, one person's idea of gliding might be different from the next guys. Uh, and perhaps maybe I didn't even define them as clear enough for them. So there is this multiple observer bias. I think that might be a lot of the issue here. Um, but also this idea of reaction time. We were making our observations in real time where we'd have somebody watching the tank, you'd wait for an event to occur, take a glance at a stopwatch, and then record that. So there's this sort of few steps, few seconds where there might be a little bit of time off and for a burst event that's split second, that can be very, very, um, you know, that could throw things off. And we did have a very high false detection rates for burst events. Um, that could have introduced some error. Um, the next thing, I thought I was choosing pretty um, easy to observe behaviors. Um, but some of these are sort of transitional. And we see this also with accelerometer deployments in humans. They've been used a lot in the medical field for assessing rehabilitation after surgeries, that sort of thing, activity monitors. Um, and they've had a lot of trouble discriminating between you know, the transition from walking to running. It's not just start and stop, you've got to build up speed. Um, and you know, the same could be said for some of my behaviors. From steady swimming to gliding, there's a bit of a transition there. From gliding to resting, you know, where do you say, okay, this is no longer a glide, the animal has stopped. Uh, there's a bit of a, a gray area there. And one person might you know, put that in one area, the computer might put that transition in another area. So there's a little bit of um, poorly defined behaviors, I think. Uh, and then <coughs> I think maybe the solutions to some of these sources, I, I, I would really like to go back and do all the observations myself. I do have video of them. So just keep a single observer, a single interpreter. And then also use some of the other axes. I, pr I primarily looked at that sway axis, the tail beats. I didn't really combine the posture with the, um, the, the sway axes, the tail beats, but that might help 
discriminate between resting and gliding. If the shark is perfectly flat and there's no tail beats, that's a rest. If it's declined and it's no tail beats, that's probably still gliding. Um, I've also got the heave axes I can use. I'm not, I'm not looking at all the information that I have here. And we do know that these animals are moving in, in three dimensions, so it's kind of silly to just look at the one. Um, but that being said, I do, I really, really think there's a lot of promise for this technique, and there have been quite a few publications coming out more recently where they have shown success. Um, it's a very young, young tool to, um, to kind of enter the scene, um, but it has been very popular. Nick Whitney has been putting them on the Osearch Sharks in Florida now. Um, but I really do, I don't want to let, I don't want my sort of inability to show their strength sort of mislead you guys. I think there's a lot of success here. Um, but one of the things that I, I did quantitatively find was um, these accelerometers, they're meant to be high resolution devices. They're measuring at a frequency, you know, from five hertz to up to 36 hertz sometimes. You know, one position every two tenths of a second. Um, so you get massive data from these devices and you're only looking at a span of an hour for instance. My deployments were an hour and 15 minutes. I think it was something like 65,000 points of information. So it, if you're manually looking at this information, trying to categorize it, that can take hours. And it did take hours. Um, but you plug it into a computer, you get pretty similar results, and it's lightning quick. So when we do get these new technologies, um, accelerometers, heart rate monitors, things that are sampling very high frequency, some of these new uh, satellite tags, perhaps, I don't know, this underwater GPS I'm trying to push for. We've got lots of information that needs to be processed and we need to manage it effectively. So these, uh, the technology that we're, we're now finding in these analytical tools for processing large information data sets is, uh, I think, very, very strong. And I certainly found this myself in the computation, comparison of the computation times between manually going through all of this and using the unsupervised analysis. The other thing I would like to try in the future is some of these supervised machine learning techniques. So rather than just um, kind of blindly classifying it, you can first train your clusters and say, okay, here is an example of a burst event that I observed manually. And you go and find the accelerometer record. And you can train these uh, machine learning techniques to then, you know, okay, these are the certain parameters that build a burst event. You look at the frequency of the tail beat, the amplitude, you can look at the mean value, you can look at you know, the variability of the accelerometer signal. You can use a lot of different components and better describe these, better quantify these things. And these algorithms, things like support vector machines, um, there's other clustering techniques that can be used. You know, they're able to use things that you can't really, you know, it's hard to look at the variability of some of these signals visually. But if you put a, assign a number to it, these computer techniques can then um, learn from those and then better discriminate on their own. And we call those supervised um, techniques. I think I've got a few more things. Yeah, OK. So that was, that was the, the main goal of this analysis. Um, but there's a lot of potential in these accelerometers for other types of work. I was looking mostly at behavior. Um, there's been a lot of work recently in using them to assess post-capture stress. And I think that's quite cool. Uh, is there a way you can move this one out of the way for me? Because my animation didn't come up. Yeah. All right, so this is one of the things Nick Whitney is doing with the O-Search, which I wanted to get proposed here, but we, we had some issues with that. But it's really cool. So he's using the accelerometer to assess energy expenditure. Accelerometer is measuring movement. And for an animal like a shark, swimming is the bulk of that movement. They are, you know that um, bulk of their energy budget comes from moving around. That's, you know, aside from metabolic costs, those sort of things, most of their uh, budget is moving. Um, by measuring movement, we're really measuring energy expenditure. We're measuring the contraction of muscles, we're measuring the release or the use of ATP. We've kind of got a proxy here for energy expenditure, and that's what this overall dynamic body acceleration is. It's essentially the absolute sum of the acceleration in each three axes, um, and you get a relative idea of um, energy expenditure from this. And they're using this to look at energy expenditure of specific events, specific behaviors, but also of post-capture release. Um, 
they're putting them on the Osearch sharks and seeing how that energy level responds after release, how it changes. Uh, so I, myself, was having to attach these loggers to smooth hounds. I figured I'm putting them through a degree of stress. Let's see if we can find, identify any kind of response to that. So what I've got here is basically all of my deployments from zero to 60 minutes um, overlaid on top of each other. And we look at the change in overall dynamic body acceleration over time throughout each of these deployments. Um, so I, I did a quick linear mix model to this, looking at the effect, basically the response of ODBA to time after capture in minutes. And then I included a random variable because I did use repeated individuals. Um, so my data wasn't very independent. So I did put a random effect for individual in there. It's a mixed model. But I get this negative slope here. It's, it's a very small slope. I am looking only at an hour here. Um, some species, I think we mentioned yesterday, is yesterday white sharks, or I forget what Herman was saying, but you know, we're, we're looking at an 18 hour to 48 hour period of recovery here. I'm only taking a look at this first 60 minutes. Um, I'm looking at a much smaller species, but there's, there's a response here. It's a negative slope. We're seeing that immediately after release, there's this high energy, and then perhaps it goes off you know, in this area to some baseline. And we can start to quantify that. We don't have a baseline, but you know, we're looking at the response. It's still of value here. Uh, can you bring that next picture up for me? Put that one back on top? No, no not that one. <laughs> Another thing I looked at here is sort of the ethogram of the successive deployments. So I would use multiple, I would do multiple deployments on the same individual and other individuals. Um, and ended up being able to use about seven deployments on each, each shark, I think. Yeah, so anyways, what we're looking here, looking at here is the proportion of time spent in each behavior um, as, the, as I do further and further deployments on the animal. We've got steady swimming up here, gliding in this area, burst swimming, and resting. Uh, and what I saw, it's not so clear in this burst event, but for each um, behavior, at about the second deployment, we see these changes. Um, the steady swimming, the second, second deployment, we see this drop in time spent steady swimming and this increase in time spent gliding and resting. Um, I would like to be able to say there's, there's an increase in the burst swimming around about the same time, but it's not as striking. Um, but what I, what I gather from this is less time spent you know, with its, norm, its normal activities, what we observe as um, its normal um, partitioning of that time spent, and more time doing these abnormal ones, maybe resting because it's been put through the stress of tagging, gliding more because it's been put through those stresses, um, and then you see this return, kind of this habituation here, return to, to normal. Um, I would like to be able to say that, you know, this increased bursting is trying to get the tag off, but it's not as clear. But this was more just kind of a, a side thing that I wanted to demonstrate how, you know, this, it's a very, very powerful tool, and I think we can get some accelerometers on some sharks. They're using them for dead reckoning underwater now. Um, there's a lot of avenues to deploy these things. Uh, and they're, they're relatively inexpensive now. Femco's got a bunch of them. <laughs> All right, so thanks. You.